Okay, so we have another reading of the word of the plea. For those listening to the recording, you're gonna hear like you're gonna hear some moments of silence. I'm just gonna be putting some stuff in the comment section as far as crowdfunding information and then the resources in the jumbotron. So give me just a couple minutes. It's gonna be quiet. So I just put the PDF of War of the Flea in the Jumbotron. And also the thread of the previous spaces are in there as well. I'm going to also put the late night space in the Jumbotron. So I don't sleep. And if I sleep, it's like for a couple of hours. So for those that find it difficult to sleep and are up late, I'm going to just be doing like random readings. So I'm going to go ahead and probably pick up on Parable of the Sore. So that's in the Jumbotron as well for anyone's interested. Again, no pressure. I have some crowdfunding posts that are bookmarked. So just give me a couple minutes to put those in the comment section and then I'll start reading. And also too, if anyone else has any crowdfunding they want to put in there, in the replies as well, feel free. And while I'm doing that, only because silence is really awkward for me, I'm going to just do like a quick, I guess, recap of the book. So basically what War of the Flea covers is like the different conditions for guerrilla warfare. And it gives concrete examples by using other conflicts so that we can learn and talk off those. For example, you know, they brought up Algeria. Vietnam was more of a thorough examination as well as some others. But basically the commonality of all of these guerrilla warfares that were fought on behalf of the people, by the people, oftentimes successful in many different ways. So that's what we're going over in War of the Flea and what that looks like. What's interesting, and what you'll probably hear me like pause and repeat throughout reading is that the conditions in which the people finally got to their breaking point and decided to galvanize a revolutionary base <laughs> is all the conditions in which we hear about people pointing out every day or people are starting to witness and say, hey, like these contradictions is going against everything I was, in indoctrin I was indoctrinated to believe. And people are looking at the material conditions. And again, that dissatisfaction is becoming a lot more vocal. So again, although it might seem simple, it's really not. If we pay attention to current events, we're actually in a very interesting times, I would say. So... Just a reminder, there's a PDF in the Jumbotron, so feel free to follow along if y'all want. And again, it's no pressure. I'm starting from chapter eight. And this one's called General Grievous on Guerrilla Warfare in Cyprus, the Political Uses of Terrorism, Errors of British Strategy. The British who are their commandos with knives, I'm sorry, the British who arm their commandos with knives and instruct them to kill from the rear protested vigorously when such tactics were applied to themselves. It may be argued that these things are only permissible in war. This is nonsense. I was fighting a war in Cyprus against the British, and if they did not recognize the fact from the start that they were forced to at the end. The truth is that our form of war, in which a few hundred fell in four years, was more selective than most and I speak as one who has been battlefields covered with dead. We did not strike like the bomber at random. We shot only British servicemen who would have killed us if they could have fired first, and civilians who were traitors or intelligence agents. To short down your or I'm sorry, to shoot down your enemies in the street may be unprecedented, but I was looking for results, not presidents. How did Napoleon win his victories? He took his opponents in the flank or rear, 
And what is right on the grand scale is not wrong when the scale is reduced and the odds against you are a hundred to one. The words are from memoirs of the EOKA leader, General George Grieva, the subject. Although Grievous is the archetype of the conservative military man, a jingo and a fascist in the eyes of the Greek communists, his philosophy of terrorism approaches that of the anarchist. The state exercises authority by the use of threat of force, argue the anarchists. The policeman on the corner is the agent as well as the symbol of it, and the revolver at his side is there to intimidate or the extremity to kill those who resist him. If then his authority is illicit, being exercised without the just consent of the governed, is it not right and natural to oppose force with force, to kill policemen as one would kill bandits, and to combat usurpers as one would combat an invasion? Mm -mm -mm. In effect, this was the reasoning that led Graveus, a Greek, I don't know that word, y'all, sorry. It looks like Capriot. Krip to declare war on the British rulers of the Greek and Turkish Cyprus. In his memoirs, he writes that it was with deep regret, but with a high sense of duty, that he took up arms in 1955 against an old friend and ally, Britain. He blames not the British people, but a band of politicians who denied even the hope of freedom to Cyprus. And he adds, it is on their hands that the guilt rests for the death of so many men, women, and children in the tragic years that followed. The beginning of the Kyprat struggle for independence was announced March 31st, 1955, by a series of explosions across the island. Saboteurs raiding the government radio station in Nicosia set off bombs that wrecked the broadcasting equipment and lifted the roof from the building, causing damage estimated at 60,000 pounds. Bombs were thrown into government office buildings and into wireless installations at the Bosley Barracks, headquarters of a British military force, which at the time numbered only 4,000 men. In the port of Limassol, and y'all, I'm butchering these names, <laughs> so my bad. In the port of Limassol, a power plant and the two main police stations were bombed at Lanarka, the police headquarters, the courts, and the British commissioner's office were all shattered by bomb blasts. The first casualty of the campaign occurred in Famagusta. A member of the EOKA group was electrocuted when he threw a damp rope over a high-tension power line in an attempt to sabotage the electrical supply. The attack took the world by surprise. Colonial officials were stunned and panic-stricken, said Gervais. The wave of bombing attacks were coupled with more general political action. Young students and school children were rapidly recruiting or recruited into the independence movement. I intended to turn the youth to Cyprus into the seedbed of EOKA, writes Gervais. And a series of successful demonstrations was organized, sufficiently violent to drive police from the streets and to require the use of soldiers to restore order. Children as young as 10 years old were used to dispute or distribute EOKA leaflets and to act as couriers. Teachers who interfered in disregard of the organization's warning were punished severely, a phrase that as Graveus employed usually meant shooting by EOKA execution squads. Pressure was put on Kyoprat newspapers that were slow to take the right tone with regard to the campaign. For example, uh -uh. sorry y'all. Newspapers that failed to denounce the passage of repressive laws. Those of weak spirit soon felt weight of the EOKA boycott. Mm. So it's interesting what we're reading is like basically how things ran under this certain regime that were fighting for liberation, according to the text we're reading. So as I was reading it, you know, I always talk about drawing parallels or, you know, trying to make it as relatable so that I can comprehend was actually going on. And to me, it's interesting that when I read about them blowing up police stations, bombing communication and radio towers that belonged, of course, to the to state media and the state apparatus that, that was only spewing like propaganda. And the way they pressured newspapers to tell the stories their way, they wouldn't allow them to be on the side of the state or corporate. And if they did, they got burned down. 
And it's interesting because when we hear these acts, we've been conditioned for so long to see these as acts of terrorism. But when we say acts of terrorism, we relate it as though it's an act of terrorism against us, even though, again, when we describe what we're describing, we're talking about the people taking control of the narrative and actually going to war with their oppressors. And what does that look like? So then that takes me back. If we've been conditioned to see our liberation as acts of terrorism, as you know, direct action, as crime, how would we then be receptive to those or receptive to the times when revolution calls for it? I think that's why it's so important we read texts like this to kind of get reintroduce us or have us question and wrestle with, again, what we've conditioned to see as a crime and what we've been conditioned to see as terrorism, especially in this in these times, because we're going to see people act out more their desire to be free and liberated. And it's not going to be polite. It also takes me back because we just finished reading the book on the last year of Martin Luther King before he died. And even though, yes, that book does a really good job of, I guess, humanizing him to the reader, one of the concerns I brought up is what happens if I was just to grapple with King's politics, a lot of the stuff I wouldn't agree with because he was liberal and liberalism only serves fascism. So, and that's what he ended up finding out too. So yeah, he could have grown from his politics eventually, but I can only judge on where he was while he was alive. And so why I say that is that I think we've been lulled into, not I think, but we've seen the limits in which certain acts of protest happen or the limits that we see the limits that certain acts of protest reach. And my thing is, I'm sorry, in our time, we need to really sit and evaluate the way we look at the spectacle of protest and how we interact with, especially those who are in the belly of the beast in the West. What I mean by that is, like we're actually seeing on our phone in real time, people who are living through a genocide all across the global South, and we get to hear their voices, but instead of relating to the cause and the struggle that enacts us to take down the Western empire, especially those who are, who are in the imperial court, instead of we're over here choosing like our favorite character, and then that person has to somehow like galvanize enough social capital to trend in order to be the one or their family be worth saving. And that again is, I think, oh, sorry, y'all, it was a glass. <laughs> that, um, to me, that, that ties into like, again, the limitations of certain things being like, uh, I guess, like advertised to us and sold to us as the way to liberation. We know that marches is not an end all be all. It's supposed to be one tactic, actually your first stage. You know what I mean? Like the beginning stage is to galvanize support and then direct action is supposed to lead to that. But we're kind of stuck on this cycle of demonstrating and marching for the sake of marching. And now we see the evolution of it, of people building careers and people, you know, becoming so-called famous or proximity to fame because of certain marches and certain messages they co-opt. But then we also see the evolution of this, to me, a very failed approach, or I could say a co-optation by the, by the system of taking these marches and making them into spectacle. It's now the people who are at the brunt force of Western imperialism, who are caught in these, these war zones of genocide and torture that now they have to use their phones to, to somehow gain a following, enough of a following to be like the favorite person chosen to hopefully win the social lottery of getting out instead of us ending genocides by shut doing direct action, general striking, shutting down the Imperial Corps, getting in ways of traffic and trade by taking over ports, literally stop going to work and stop funding the machine that is killing us 10 times over. I don't know, basically, where I'm landing at is we need to really look at the most pop, the ways that are the popular ways to talk about protest and see how it, again, are we at the point in time where nonviolence helps the state? I say we've always been there, but the new people or people who are just now waking up to their material conditions need to, we all need to really grapple with that and say, hey, this is not enough. This is not the time to pat ourselves on the back for showing up at a protest. We really need to understand how we need to destroy this system and dismantle it completely, or we won't have another five or 10 years to be able to do so.
But again, in order to get to that point, though, you have to awaken a consciousness in which you would be able to see someone burning down a bank and you would know why. And you wouldn't have a fear of, oh, someone's going to call the police and turn people into the state that we will we will understand our conditions, understand where we are. And understand that the time calls for us to choose a side and the side should always be on the side of the oppressed. And that's not going to look pretty. It's not going to be like a, a nice marshadow trend. What will usually happen is you'll see people going at the state, killing the police, having self-defense groups, pulling out of corporate food by growing their own food and becoming food sovereign. Yeah. So we're going to continue reading because that's kind of what is going to also get covered more so the violence and what that looks like. And I call it resistance. So. But on this page, he's going to call it terrorism. So I don't want us to get confused either. The wave of terrorism had been initiated by an extremely small group of men, not more than 80. According to Grivez, I'm so sorry, y'all, for saying all these names wrong, organized into sabotage squads of five or six in all of the principal cities and towns of the island. There were, as yet, no guerrilla units, although Grivez had personally reconnected the island, making notes of favorable places for ambushes, terrain suitable to provide bases for guerrilla action, and so on. The excellent networks of roads across the island mitigated against an extensive guerrilla campaign, and most of those who were to fight as guerrillas were not sent into the countryside until they had outlived their usefulness in the towns by becoming too well known to risk being seen in the streets. The mountains of the Kyrena range and the heavily wooded Trotos range in the southwest were, however, subsequently used as bases of guerrilla operations and for the training of sabotage teams. After the first outbreak of bombings, there was a lull in the terror campaign, broken for some weeks only by isolated attacks against what grievous caused targets of opportunity. One of these, according to the memoirs, was Sir Robert Armitage. Butcher in this crack his name, the British governor of Cyprus. As part of Empire Day celebrations in Nicosia, the governor attended a film premiere at the Palace Cinema. He sat throughout the showing for two hours, only a few feet from the seat under which a time pencil attached to a Coca Cola bottle filled with explosive slowly burned. The picture ended. The governor and his party left the theater. Five minutes later, the bomb exploded, shattering seven rows of vacant seats and reeling the ceiling with shrapnel. Grievous spent the time between attacks traveling about Nicosia and, on occasion, into the Kyrena Mountains, giving orders to group leaders, supervising training, preparing propaganda releases, and generally bolstering morale by his appearances. His identity as Dingus the leader the way in which he invariably signed his communi sorry, communiques. Oh, I hate French. <laughs> I'm mistake. It's communications, but they have it in French. It's one communist party here, because in the past, against Fidel Castro, when they were fighting for their independence there in Cuba. So it makes sense why they would go against the guerrilla fighters here at Cyprus because they're just state puppets. Uh, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Taking the same cue, the leader of the Greek Communist Party disclosed in a broadcast from Moscow that Dingus was Chigurebeas, while known to the communists as the leader of the Greek underground organizations of the Second World War, called Z and later as a commander of Greek army operations against the communist guerrillas of ELAS in the Greek Civil War. Comically, the British did not take this piece of information seriously, recalls Javeris. The idea of an elderly retired officer as the leader of EOKA was too strange for them to accept. Dingus continued to move about freely in the thin disguise of dark glasses and a clipped mustache. For a time, he established a headquarters in the mountains, but later, he relates, he hid in a house in Lamisol for two years without being discovered or betrayed. EOKA's second wave of attacks came in June. The first victim of the campaign was a policeman killed when a bomb blew a hole in the wall of a divisional police headquarters in Nicosia. 
16 men were wounded. A sergeant was killed when an assault group attacked the... Whew, y'all, these little French words. I'm just going to keep going. Police station and several other stations were attacked. Reveas had personally selected a target, the commander-in-chief of British land forces in the Middle East. General Kitely, who was accustomed to drive to the drive daily into the capital from his home on the Karina coast, he says, I found a good place for an ambush on the pass over the Karina mountains, writes Gruveres. But Archbishop Marcuzio vetoed the plan and the idea was abandoned. The memoirs reveal that Mercurios vetoed a good many plans proposed by the leader and often dragged his feet when Greers would have foraged boldly ahead. The archbishop held the purse strings. Without funds, Greers un was unable to proceed and was forced to reconsider some of his more drastic schemes, as for example, when he wished to send execution squads to London to assassinate known Kripriot informers living in Britain on the rewards of their betrayals. In general, however, the campaign proceeded as Graves wished it to, with the leader maintaining a rigid discipline over his scattered troops of terrorists and saboteurs. I issued frequent warnings that I alone would give orders. Disobedience would be punished by death. Although Graves was that at the onset, he would have been able, given 500 armed men, to drive the British into the sea. The remark is not to be taken seriously. From the start, he saw very clearly that his victory would be political rather than military. This is made clear in the general plan, which he drew up in Athens two years before the first bomb exploded in Nicosia. Number one, the objective. To arouse international political opinion, especially among the allies of Greece, by deeds of heroism and self-sacrifice, which will focus attention on Cyprus until our aims are achieved. The British must be continuously harried and beset until they are ob obliged by international diplomacy, exercised to the United Nations to examine the Cyprus problem and sell it in accordance with the desires of the Cypriot people and the whole Greek nation. Number two, the procedure. Activity will be aimed at causing so much confusion and damage in the ranks of the British forces as to make it manifest abroad that they are no longer in complete control of the situation. The campaign will be carried out in three fronts. One, sabotage against government installations and military posts. Two, attacks on British forces by a considerable number of armed fighting groups. Three, organization of passive resistance by the population. Because of the difficulties in the way of a large-scale guerrilla struggle, the main weight of the campaign will be placed on sabotage, and therefore, the chief task of the fighting groups will be to support and cover the work of saboteurs by upsetting and diverting the government forces. Success will not be achieved by minor and intermittent attacks, but only by a continuous campaign aimed at getting important results. It should not be supposed that by these means, we should expect to impose a total material defeat on the British forces. Our purpose is to bring about a moral defeat by keeping up the offensive until the objectives stated in the first paragraph of this plan are realized. By the end of June 1955, the second phase of the campaign had ended. EOKA fighters were informed in a bulletin that the material results had not been up to the expectations of the leader. There had been few casualties and the damage caused by the sabotage had been relatively insignificant from the economic point of view. Presumably, it was the switch, I'm sorry, it was this to which Graveus referred when he spoke of material results. In political terms, however, EOKA campaign had already achieved a considerable measure of success. The primary purpose of the organization was being realized. The issue of self-determination for Cyprus had been called dramatically to the attention of the world. British public opinion in particular had been aroused, and with the anticipation re anticipated results, the policy of a government that had said it could never consider Cypriot independence. Oh, I'm so sorry for butchering those people's names. Cyprus supposedly being indispensable to Britain's military security in the Mediterranean was being questioned. And there were already second thoughts about the world. I'm sorry, the word never. Two years earlier, the British had refused to discuss Cyprus with the Greek uh, government. 
Now the prime minister, Sir Anthony Eaton, sent invitations to both Athens and Ankara to attend a interpret and conference in London. Archbishop Mercurios <laughs> seeking a larger forum and a better solution than could be expected from any such meeting, flew to Athens to press the Greek government to appeal to the United Nations. Before leaving, he sent Gravas his congratulations, adding, EOKA has contributed infinitely more to the Cyprus struggle than 75 years of paper war. The name of Dingus is an enigma to the British and it is a legend as well. Already it has passed into the pages of the liberation movement's history. Gervais was preparing a general attack, time to coincide with the meeting of the United Nations General Assembly in the autumn. As an initial step, he proposed to put the native police force out of action as a reliable law enforcement agency, so as to compel the British to extend their military forces, which are being used mainly to guard government buildings or held in their barracks for riot duty and similar emergencies. In an order dated 28th of June, he informed EOKA group leaders, the aim of our next offensive will be to terrorize the police and to paralyze the administration, both in the towns and the countryside. If this aim is achieved, the results will be threefold. Disillusionment. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Disillusionment will spread through the police force so rapidly that most of them, if they do not actually help us, will turn a blind eye to our activities. Active intervention of the army and security, which will stretch the troops and tire them out. The falling morale of the army will also influence its leaders. In the face of our strength and persistence and the trouble they cause, it is very probable that the United Nations through member countries who take an interest in Cyprus affairs will seek to bring about a solution. The results we want will be obtained by one, murderous attack against policemen who are out of sympathy with our aims and who will try to hunt us down. Two, ambushes against police patrols in towns or raids on country police stations. Three, obstructing free movement of the police across the island by laying ambushes against individuals or groups. The police were given notice of what to expect in a leaflet posted on walls in the villages and scattered through the city streets by school children. To the police, I have warned you and I shall carry out my warning to the letter. Darker days await the tyrants of Cyprus. Heavier punishment, the traitors. Do not try to block our path or you will stain it with your blood. I have given my orders that anyone who tries to stop the patriots will be executed. Anyone who tries to arrest or to search patriots will be shot. You have nothing to fear so long as you do not get in our way. EOKA, the leader, Dingus. Again, I know I'm saying a lot of these names wrong. <laughs> Sorry. But as I was reading that too, and I'll probably wait till the end of the chapter to go over it, but one of the things that's important too is that just because we see these acts happen, or people speak a certain language, meaning certain groups, or even individuals who seek to make a name for themselves. We have to be discerning, especially in our times, because, you know what, I'm gonna wait after the chapter, I'm gonna write a note, but after, after we're done reading this chapter, I'll go into it. But reading this, it there's a point to be learned here. So I'm gonna keep going. Having given warning, EOKA proceeded with a series of raids on police stations that served a twofold purpose. The attacks frightened the police and also gave the organization a means of getting badly needed arms, since few were arriving from Greece, where the first weapons and supplies had been obtained. The campaign in the town's lagged, a fact which Graveus explains almost apologetically, was due to the total inexperience of the execution groups. Results were nevertheless obtained. Several policemen were killed and others wounded in Nicosia and Famagusta. Scores resigned and those who remained, says Graveus, scarcely dared show their faces outside of their stations. The effect of the raids was to throw the administration entirely on the defensive. Armed centenaries walked around and around the police stations at night. And when the police had to close a station temporarily, they took all of their weapons with them. The British knew next to nothing about EOKA, who its members were, 
where they might be found. Those who might have been able to tell them the Greek Confederate members of the police force were soon silenced. On August 28th, a constable of the special branch who had been marked for death because of his too zealous application to duty was posted at a political meeting in Leger Street in Nicosia. He was shot down before a crowd of hundreds by a young government clerk, Michael Carolis, a member of the three-man EOKA execution squad. The killing in broad daylight before hundreds of people in the heart of the capital was a fatal blow to pol police morale. The killer, Carolis, was later caught and sentenced to death, but his work had been done. The slaying of the special branch man, says Graveus, shattered opposition to EOKA among the Greek police. Increasingly, Turks were recruited to replace Greeks on the police force, intensifying the hostility between the two ethnic communities. Of the Greeks who remained on the British payroll, many became spies for EOKA, accurately informing the organization of British intentions from day to day. Those who were not so employed uh, closed their eyes to EOKA's activities, as Graveas had predicted, and ceased to be of effective service to the British or a hindrance to the liberation movement. British propaganda was bitter in its denunciation of the methods used by EOKA, but Grievous was not concerned. As he later wrote, all war is cruel, and the only way to win against superior force is by ruse and trickery. You can no more afford to make a difference between striking in front or striking from behind than you can between employing rifles and houses. The British may criticize me as much as they like for making war in Cyprus, but I was not obliged to ask their permission to do so, nor can they now deny that I made it in the most successful way. Terrorism was supported by intensive political agitation that brought out huge crowds in the principal towns. During one demonstration in Nicosia in September, army trucks were overturned and set afire, and the British Institute was burned to the ground. The headlines generated by this activity failed to win Greece a hearing on the Cyprus question in the United Nations. The Greek appeal was rejected on September 23rd, but the EOKA campaign has shaken the British. Two days after the UN rejection, it was announced in London that a new governor would replace Sir Robert Armitage immediately. The replacement was the much decorated Field Marshal Sir John Hardy, an outstanding British general of the Second World War, who had just relinquished the post of Chief of the Imperial General Staff. He was, in fact, writes Gruveas, the leading British soldier of his day, and no higher compliment could have been paid us than to send against our tiny forces a man with so great a reputation and so brilliant a career. <laughs> Harding as it developed, was to have no better success against EOKA than had his predecessors. The appointment of a military man to replace the civilian governor made it clear that Downing Street intended to stamp out EOKA by main force rather than to continue a police action. The trouble, as is usually the case when opposing guerrillas and even more so when fighting terrorists, was that there was nothing substantial against which to apply the force. As Grievous explains, the British answer to our methods was to flood the island with troops. It was the wrong answer. Numbers have little meaning in guerrilla warfare. From the guerrilla's point of view, it is positively dangerous to increase the size of groups beyond a certain point. I call this the saturation point. It is determined by the nature of the terrain and the skill of the fighters, their requirements in food and supplies, the tactics employed, and the need to keep down casualties. Any given area, can usefully absorb a certain number of men. In mountainous country, where peaks and ravines are dead ground, the figure is only a fraction of the number required elsewhere. I myself, when I joined the Andardis in the mountains, always felt uneasy if there were more than half a dozen of us together. Even in the plains, the saturation point is lower than one might suppose. For example, to use more than five or six men in a village attack would serve no purpose, for the more numerous the attacks, the more difficult it is for them to escape after the action. On the same principle, villages where we were strong pretended inertia, on my orders, until it was appropriate for them to strike, while others, where our forces were weaker, continued to attack repeatedly, simply to, achieve, to deceive the enemy. If this led to arrest, 
even of a whole group, it was not important, for there was only a complete reserve group waiting to fill their places. Thus, I never disclosed my full strength to the enemy, but after each sudden eruption of violence left an empty battlefield. When the British tried to strike back, they found nothing to strike at. This was the secret of my success throughout four years of hard fighting, and my principles did not change when Harding came on the scene. It is well to remember Grievous is talking about a campaign based primarily on terrorism and sabotage, fought on a small island affording little space for maneuver, and aimed at political rather than military effect. He was not trying to build self-sustaining guerrilla base areas or to reach ultimate guerrilla goal impossible in Cyprus of an equalization of military forces. In terms of Cyprus, small guerrilla units could be treated as expendable. They were expendable in precisely the way that terrorists are expendable, who do not seek to build a military force, but rather to produce political and psychological effects, often by sacrificing themselves. Grievous clearly used his urban and rural groups in interaction. When he wished to conduct a campaign in the countryside, he raised big political demonstrations in the towns that kept the troops occupied there on riot duty, while his guerrilla groups made lightning attacks and rural objectives. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. When he was planning, and the reason why I said exactly is because I'm not, I hope I didn't give the impression earlier that it is a complete waste of time for demonstrations. No, they have their use. They have many different uses. Like I said, raise awareness of the cause, but then also too can be used as a distraction, but not a distraction to distract the people. <laughs> It should be to distract the state in order to have, you know, the real plan go down. But that's what he's explaining here, what happened in Guerrilla 4. What they used in, in this attack, how they used demonstrations, was again to distract the police. So they had used all their resources to try to tame the crowd. So now you have all your police in one area. So that I left them unable to respond to other bombings and other direct actions that they did in order to gain ground for the liberation movement. So I'll go back to reading. When he was planning a new drive in the cities, he created diversions in the countryside that brought the troops out in intensive, I'm sorry, I don't know that word, rassages. My resources were meager, and I cannot hope to win a military victory, he writes. It was rather a question of raising a force and keeping it, being no matter what the enemy did to destroy it. This and more was achieved in the first six months. Ooh, shit. On his arrival in Nicosia, Harding made a cursory attempt to negotiate with our bishop, Mercurios. When the negotiations broke down within a few days, Grievous ordered a full-scale EOKA offensive. New attacks were launched against village police stations in an effort to draw out the army. EOKA men raided the Maestro 9, no, the Mistero Mine, yeah, the Mistero Mine and escaped with 1,500 stations. timing of the announcement that Michael Carolos, the first hero of the revolution, had been sentenced to death could not have been worse. The announcement came on October 28th, a national holiday marking the refusal of Greece to surrender to the Axis powers in 1940. Harding banned any sort of public demonstration. Grievous responded by calling on Kyprats to defy the ban, and a series of bloody clashes result. Troop it, troops opened fire on a riotous crowd, wounding three men, and there were more than a thousand arrests, jamming the jails of the principal towns as the result of street fighting. R British troops occupied in the towns by demonstrations and sabotage, Grievous ordered an island-wide assault. It began on November 18th, when more than 50 bombs were thrown into 30 separate attacks throughout Cyprus. By the end of the week, several hundred attacks had been carried out. The main post office in Nicosia was bombed. The bomb simply dropped in the letterbox in half, um, in the letterbox, and half the building was destroyed. An eight-pound bomb carried into the Nico military encampment outside of Nicosia in the saddlebag of a bicycle blew the roof off the warrant's office. Mm. The warrant officers and sergeants mess and killed two sergeants. Army post Alamosa and Lanarka were attacked. Guerrillas in the 
Kyrenia range. And just again, y'all, I'm saying I'm butchering all of these names, but guess what? The PDF is in the Jumbotron, so I encourage y'all to find out what these names really are. <laughs> Guerrillas in the Kyrenia range attacked two mines and engaged in firefights with the troops detailed to guard them. Mine company trucks carrying dynamite were ambushed and near Famagusta, three military vehicles were blasted off the road, causing the army to stop all military movement on the roads at night. Damn. Jeevas himself led an ambush attack on two army trucks, destroyed one, and then withdrew with his squad to a nearby hilltop and calmly swashed as a relief party, which did not appear until three hours after the attack, removed the body of a dead soldier from the wreckage. No attempt was made to search the area. A state of emergency was declared throughout the island on November 26. Police were given extraordinary powers of search and arrest. Strikes were forbidden. The death penalty was imposed for carrying arms and saboteurs were liable to life imprisonment. British troops responding to the assassination of their comrades in arms, much as the Black and Tans had, been, had done in Ireland, vented their feelings on the civilian population. Soldiers stopped farm trucks on the way to market and dumped their loads of fruit and vegetables out on the road. Search parties invaded private, private homes and abused the occupants and destroyed their possessions. Suspects were arrested without warrant and held for weeks or months in detention camps without trial. The security forces set out their work, um, comments, gervais, in a manner which might have been deliberately designed to drive the population into arms. It had that effect. So basically what your virus is saying is like what ended up happening is, is they the state ended up helping their recruiting numbers better than they did because the repression that followed after the full on scale attack on the island on behalf of the liberation movement, they ended up destroying people's homes, possessions, and robbing them and imprisoning them for life. And you can only imagine if you read between the lines, like what is what all could have taken place that wasn't even noted here. So in, oftentimes when the state becomes even more repressive, you end up having people turning in neighbors, turning in people at work, every, the height of paranoia, neighbors no longer trusting each other because now people are deputizing themselves as informant for the state because they see that as a way to survive, quote unquote, by complying. That kind of hostility that the state is just bearing down on the people, making it impossible to choose anything else but liberation so then they ended up siding with the uh, the resistance so basically Gervais who I'm butchering his name is basically saying like thanks to the British troops y'all helped a lot and the gov uh, of course the will of the British government imposed upon them uh, Gervais had gone into the Trudeau's mountains to coordinate guerrillas operations and on several occasions he narrowly escaped British commandos combing the area where he happened to be hiding. On one occasion, two British forces totaling 700 men lost in the mist on the mountainside, closed in on each other as the guerrillas escaped and engaged in a battle with each other that lasted for an hour before they discovered that they were firing on their own troops. There were more than 50 casualties. So, <laughs> so the British went to this area thinking they were fighting off guerrillas and... <laughs> Once the dust settled, they found out they were just killing each other. <laughs> Yo. Sorry, I had to grab something to drink. I lost my place. Oh. On New Year's Day of 1956, Hardy's broadcast the prediction that the days of EOKA are numbered. The following day, 800 British troops closed in on a wood where Gervais was thought to be, spent the entire day combing an area two miles square and withdrew with three prisoners. Gervais reports, I was in fact a few miles south of the operations area, watching the progress of the search through binoculars. I was astonished at the unmethodological, unmethodol oh, now I can't even talk. <laughs> Unmethod, we're just gonna pass it on y'all. Just believe I know it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm shipping on that word today. Uh, the methodical, <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm, I cannot say that word today. Way the troops went about their work. On the 22nd of the month, EOKA units simultaneously, oh, but I could say that, 
raided every village on Cyprus in an effort to gather up all of the several thousand shotguns on the island that were registered with the police. One EOKA man was wounded and a soldier was killed in the raids. More than 800 shotguns were seized and Graveus proceeded to organize special shotgun units. These were used to harry the British by night, attack army camps, create diversions for major guerrilla attacks, and execute traitors. By February 1956, the strength of the army had been increased from 4,000 to some 22,000 men. EOKA by this time had a total frontline strength of 273 men. Oh, damn. Supported by some 750 part time guerrillas in the villages, armed only with shotguns. The frontline fighters included 80 men divided into 15 groups. Hmm. And Nicosia, 70, 76 men in Famagusta, and 34 men in Limassol. Oh, I'm butchering these cities. The three principal towns of the island. The numerical odds were vastly in favor of the British, but Graveus considered the army, supported by 5,000 police, a cumbersome, a cucumbersome body that provided a wealth of targets, new and old, in both town and mountain. So it proved. Oh. So on this part, basically what Graveus is talking about is, yeah, they were outnumbered. But remember, in the previous chapters we read, as, as well as this um, chapter earlier on, that numbers can actually count against you. That numbers isn't the size of your army actually can work against you in guerrilla warfare. And that's why it's so effective. So they basically played into the, uh, the guerrilla army's hand. Graveus intensified his campaign of terror and sabotage. The homes of British senior officers were bombed. British servicemen were shot down in the streets. Bombs were tossed into clubs and taverns frequented by troops. A servant who belonged to EOKA even succeeded in planting a bomb under the mattress of Sir John Harding's bed. Fortunately for the governor, a sudden change in the temperature, so Grivius explains, affected the time pencil and the bomb did not explode until after it had been discovered and removed. The British seem to have learned little or nothing from their previous experience of terrorism elsewhere. Efforts to intimidate the civilian population that aided EOKA only embittered it. The experiment of imposing collective fines on the Greek community in reprisal against attacks on British forces the levies ranged from a few hundred pounds in some small villages to 40,000 pounds in Famagusta and 35,000 in Limassol was abandoned after six months as ineffective. Stern measures against captured EOKA fighters not only failed to act as a deterrent, but created severe political repercussions. When the first of the EOKA gunmen to be executed were hanged for a murder in central prison, Nicosia, on May 10, 1956, huge demonstrations in Greece were called in protest. Seven persons were killed in a riot in Athens, and the mayor of the city solemnly hammered to pieces a marble plaque dedicated to Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip before the eyes of a cheering crowd. Even the British press condemned the hangings. No doubt sympathy was felt for the two British hostages whom Graveas had executed by EOKA the next day in reprisal for the executions, but... The headlines had already been spent on what millions evidently considered a miscarriage of British justice. It is an irony of political warfare and a political fact to be considered and understood that the rules are not the same for both sides. And that is something even not even talking outside of terms of guerrilla warfare, just as as the way we navigate politics, we need to understand the side of the oppressed and the side of the oppressor are not the same. So when people say, oh, if you use violence, you're just as bad as your oppressors. No, the fuck you're not. Getting free is defense and it's intelligent because that is how we're supposed to be. Like this system imposed upon us, that is the violent act and it needs to be destroyed and met with a greater violence. So yes, the rules are not the same for both sides. British troops fared no better against the EOKA guerrillas in the countryside than against the terrorists in the towns. The troops burned thousands of acres of timber and scattered efforts to flush out guerrilla bands on the mountainsides, but few guerrillas were caught, and those were quickly replaced by others. Harding tried to strike back at the mountain groups, writes Grievous, but lacking any comprehensive plan and failing to grasp our methods, he had few successes. His activities were dependent on 
uh, spermatic tips from inferiors, I'm sorry, informers, which were often in, in, inexact and unreliable and led him to concentrate on narrow zones. As many as 50 truckloads of troops would be poured into one small area, which would be searched for a day. But nearly always, we slipped away before the search began and watched its progress from the neighboring heights, certain that they would not extend the operation beyond its original limits. What should have been done? Examining his opponent's problem in retrospect, Grievous says, Harding persisted in his error. He underrated his enemy on the one hand and overweighted his forces on the other. But one does not use a tank to catch field mice. A cat will do the job better. The field marshal's only hope of finding us was to play cat and mouse, to use tiny, expertly trained groups who could work with cunning and patience and strike rapidly when we, last expect, when we least expected. No such groups were ever deployed, and the war continued along the lines with the results that might have been expected. What Harding was unable to accomplish with 20,000 troops in 1956 cannot be accomplished by his successor with twice that many in 1958. 43,000 British soldiers were on Cyprus when the shooting ended, but what they were doing there, few could have said. Certainly, they were not keeping the peace. Grievous offers his record of EOKA activities for October 2nd, 1958, as giving an idea of the scale of operations at the time. Oh, y'all. Okay, usually I like doing the scripts, but these names I cannot do. So I'm going to give them short. So Lanarka is L. And I'll make it plain, but just know I'm struggling over here. All right. So this is the operations of from Lanarka, Nicosia, and Famagusta, and Lemassol, and Platani. God damn. All right. So in Lanarka, soldiers killed by bomb. Civilians agents shot dead by execution squad. And then in Nicosia, bomb thrown into police headquarters from car. Casualties unknown. In Famagusta, two army trucks ambushed. Casualties unknown. In Limassol, eight Britons injured by bomb at an Acropole hotel, four soldiers injured by bomb thrown at truck. And in a place called Plantani, two soldiers killed, two wounded in mine truck. Oh my God. Okay, so this next one is called Panyai. Oh, mm -mm. it is a name, y'all. It's on page 118 and it's in a PDF if y'all want to know it. But so this one we're going to call in P. Stravos. So in P. Strabos, two soldiers were killed, two wounded in an ambush. In Pyroi, truck was ambushed and casualties were unknown. In Masoi, two soldiers killed in ambush of a truck. In P.Y., two soldiers killed, two wounded in mine truck. In Peristonia, Stona, bombs thrown at two army trucks, casualties unknown. So basically, they just gave a list of events at that time on October 2nd. And those different towns and cities that I could not pronounce to save my whole life. <laughs> Back to the book. The British authorities were embittered by the struggle, but did little to change its course by involving the Turkish community in the fighting. The recruitment of Turks into the police and the excitement of a latent racial antagonism produced some bloody civ civilian massacres and a tragic toll of innocent lives on both sides. But divide and rule as an instrument of British policy failed in Cyprus. The eventual political settlement that was reached in the Zurich and London agreements, establishing the Republic of Cyprus under a constitution written by London, Athens, and Ankara, was less than satisfactory to Grievous. He had fought for the independence of the island as a step towards union with Greece, and this was denied. But the British could scarcely claim to have won even a partial victory. They had paid a heavy price in money, lives and prestige during four years of futile fighting and had nothing to show for it but a paper compromise that was worse than outright defeat, where they had been a troublesome colony question, colonial question, an explosive international issue was created, and one that remains to date a grave threat to peace in the Mediterranean, a threat not least of all to the British themselves. As to the conflict that led to Zurich, it was round by round a series of clear defeats for colonial arms and colonial policies. 
the British proceeded against EOKA as against a band of ordinary criminals, relying on the methods that would be used to put down an outbreak of banditry and seemed never to realize what had been perfectly clear to Grius from the start. I laughed out loud when I read that General A and Brigadier B had come to Cyprus to put into operation the methods that had won him fame elsewhere. They could not understand that the Cyprus struggle was unique in motive, psychology, and circumstance, and involved not a handful of insurrectionists, but the whole people. So that's the end of chapter eight. Let's see how far I've been reading. That's yeah, almost about an hour. The next chapter is called Failures in the War of the Flea. Magsaysay and the Hux in the Philippines, the price of the British victory in Malaya, and why the communists lost in Greece. So that's going to be an interesting one. I do want to read more, but unfortunately I have to go. But if anyone has any questions, oh, before I go, I do encourage people to look at the comments section and to share those crowdfund posts. I have a few more I'm going to put in there, but um, yeah, to check back, I think I'm going to add two more I have that I just saw on the timeline. And also, too, there is information and resources in the Jumbotron. So with that, oh, also, too, I'll have a late night space because I know I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. But if you want to join, again, it's no pressure. We're going to be reading uh, Octavia Butler, Parable of the Solar. So we're already in March 13th, I think it was, uh, 2025. So that's been an interesting read. So with that, of course, like I say all the time, you know, look out for each other and take care of each other. And above all, let's get free.